So I started writing this book uh, in July of 2018. I was uh, determined to write this book. This was my second book. I wrote another book that probably some of you have read called Red Notice. And Red Notice was all about my time trying to get the um, Magnitsky Act passed and the murder of Sergei Magnitsky. But so much stuff had happened between 2012 when the Magnitsky Act was passed and 2018, so much crazy stuff, I felt it was really uh, absolutely essential that I, I write this book and uh, tell this story. So I put the phone down and I spent an hour struggling to get like 50 words on paper and it just wasn't coming out. And, uh, and I finally couldn't um, take it anymore so I grabbed my phone and turned it over. And there were like 150 messages on my phone. And um, the first message saying, are you watching Helsinki? Um, and the second message said, what the F? And it turned out that um, while I was writing, uh, trying to write my book, um, there was a meeting going on between um, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin in Helsinki. This was the Helsinki summit. And the Helsinki summit uh, was uh, taking place on a Monday. And on the previous Friday, the uh, special counsel, Robert Mueller, the person whose job it was to investigate um, Russian collusion and interference in the US political process, he had indicted 12 Russian military intelligence officers. They come out into a press conference. Trump has kind of got his head down. Putin is strutting like he owns the place. And they stand up at their respective podiums, and questions start. And several questions in, a Reuters journalist raises his hand, asks Putin, um, are you going to hand over those 12 uh, Russian GRU officers? And Putin had obviously been preparing for this question all weekend, and he smiled very smugly. And he said, you know, Probably yes, uh, but we would expect some reciprocity in this case. And if we were to provide these 12 uh, GRU officers, we would expect uh, Donald Trump to hand over Bill Browder. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of crazy why Putin was so desperate to have me hand it over. Um, and I should also point out that Putin almost never uh, mentions the name of his enemies. He doesn't actually mention the name Alexei Navalny. Uh, he never mentioned the name Boris Nemtsov. Uh, he, he almost never mentions the name of any enemy, but the fact that he had mentioned my name was so significant because I had gotten him so rattled because of the Magnitsky Act. Now, why did Putin care so much about the Magnitsky Act? And this is what my book is about. And this is also, I think what this war is about in Ukraine. And the reason that Putin cares so much about the Magnitsky Act, and I've discovered this and, and, and researched it and have proven it, is that um, between the year 2000, when Putin came to power, and 2022, now, Putin and about 1,000 people around him in the government have stolen a trillion dollars from the Russian people. That's a thousand billion dollars. That's just, it's just an unbelievably large amount of money. And that money has been kept not inside Russia. That money has been kept in the West. And by passing the Magnitsky Act, getting the Magnitsky Act passed, which was named after my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who Michelle just talked to you about, um, that freezes the assets and bans the visas of Russian human rights violators and kleptocrats, and human rights violators and kleptocrats all over the world. And Putin felt like his entire raison d'etre was basically put at risk by the Magnitsky Act. I, I think that I'm gonna leave it at that so that we can do some Q&A because um, every, I, Ever since I've 
published this book that the, everybody wants to know what's going to happen next in Ukraine and various other things. And, and so I think um, I, I will l let the conversation flow where it's going to flow. Thank you. Yesterday evening, I watched the, the documentary on uh, Alexei Navalny. And it was also about, I was completely shocked, actually I knew uh, a lot about it, how it really happened, how he was poisoned, how we discovered the poisoning. But actually there was, um, yeah, the coincidence was how he found out who tried to kill him. He got the information from Christo Grosiev from Bellingcat. And he used the same method you used in your book to find out where the money went to. You started at the Grobushka, this market, in this electronics market in Moscow, where I always bought my cables for my computers, but uh, you also could buy there all the data of Russian government institutions, of banks, etc. How come? Russia is a very bureaucratic place. And so if you go to the bathroom, you've got to fill out a form. And, and, and then that, 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 the information from that form goes to four different ministries. And that happens for everything in Russia. It's everything is documented. And then the people who collect this information, they're paid so poorly that there's no way they could survive off their official salaries. So they all get into the information business. And they provide this information to people who then, um, for money, who then accumulate it on, on disks or thumb drives or... Uh, uh, and then there's a place called the Gorbushka um, Information Market. And you can literally buy any information you want at Gorbushka or one of its offshoots. So if I want to get your bank information, I want to know what you've been doing with your bank account, I can get your bank information. That's easy like that. If I want to find out where you've traveled to, no problem. Mobile phone data, easy. Um, and so, I mean, it's kind of disturbing if, you, if you're living in Russia because everything is available. But if you're investigating criminal activity, it's pretty exciting. Some of your legal advisors told you to go to, to, to this market to buy this information. From that on, you knew where to find where the money went to. So, so we wanted to know, Sergei Magnitsky was murdered because he uncovered a $230 million government corruption scheme. And I wanted to know who got that $230 million so that we could make sure that they don't enjoy it and they have it taken away from them. And, um, and so we then started to buy databases which would tell us where, where the money went. And it wasn't just Gorbushka where we got the money, I mean, we got the um, information. Anytime a dollar is transferred anywhere in the world, um, from, even from one Russian bank to another Russian bank, the dollar then has to go f for a fraction of a second through New York, through what's called a dollar clearing bank, through the SWIFT system. And so the information also exists in New York. And there's no Gorbushka in New York, but um, if you become the victim of a crime um, or there's a civil lawsuit going on, you can show up in a New York court and you can ask for a, something called the 1782 subpoena where you can ask Citibank or J.P. Morgan or Wells Fargo or one of the other big banks to hand over the information that will help you solve the crime. And so between Gorbushka and the 1782 subpoena, um, we were able to build a pretty interesting roadmap of where the money went from the $230 million that killed Sergei Magnitsky. But when did you discover that they were all protected by Putin? Because his police officers got a medal from Putin when you were already proceeding against him. Before the, the um, or just after the Magnitsky Act was passed. 2012. Uh, 2012, um, Putin basically declared at a national press conference that every single person who was accused was innocent. When Putin did that, he had basically become uh, involved at that moment in time when he announced as president of Russia that, that everybody was innocent. He was then participating in a conspiracy to cover up a murder. And that, that was the first moment that it became clear that, that Putin was like really up to his eyeballs in this thing. Yeah. How, how does it work, actually, the money laundering in Russia? Well, so what we discovered um, was the Magnitsky case, or the crime that Sergei Magnitsky discovered, which was $230 million, was one of a thousand 
similar scams and crimes. All this money was basically not spent on the Russian people. It was spent, it was basically ferried out of the country. Yeah. It all went through one bank, Dansky Bank, and one branch of Dansky Bank, their Estonian branch. 232 billion is the number that was laundered through Dansky Bank. And this is just one bank. This is not Raiffeisen Bank. That's another bank where a lot of money was laundered. Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank was another money. So we can prove 232. And we also know that the total amount of, of capital flight that's come out of Russia um, is about a trillion. And I believe that all the capital flight that's come out of Russia is effectively the same type of money that was laundered through yeah. Dansky Bank. Did this proof help you getting the Magnitsky Act adopted in Europe? Because this was 2017. The Act was adopted in Europe in 2020. No, it, it, it didn't help at all. Uh, the, 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 the person that helped get the Magnitsky Act passed in Europe is, is sitting Short, right there. Short Schwarzma. From right, right there, Short Schwarzma. Goed gedaan, Short. How could it be a bad thing to, to freeze the assets of torturers, murderers, and kleptocrats? Sort of obvious, right? I mean, you know, that's sort of a no-brainer. Yeah. But where did this reluctance come from? It came from every government in the world. I mean, the United States did it first. It wasn't easy there. Mm. Canada did it second. It wasn't so easy there. Nobody wants to do it. Why? Why? Because everybody wants to, wanted to continue doing business with Putin. Let's, let's go to the war. How do you think this will end? This whole system, this whole regime of Putin, this whole, it's a mafia <laughs> system. It can last for another 20 years or another 30 years. I'm always being asked by, by other journalists, but how long will it last? What do you think? Guess. There's three ways that this thing could end, or I should start, not, not end because not all three end. I mean, the first is that the Ukrainians could win this war. That's not an impossibility. That's a real possibility. Um, they could win entirely. And if they were to win, Putin would no longer be in power, and that would be the end of this terrible nightmare. I would say there's a 15% chance that the um, Ukrainians win, and I think there's a 15% chance that somehow Putin um, ends up on the border of Estonia. And there's a 70% chance that this thing carries on and on and on when nobody wins. Um, and that's another really bad scenario because um, uh, the longer it goes on, the more we lose interest, the more the populism comes into dem democratic situations. Remember, we were all outraged about Syria. We don't even talk about Syria anymore. Assad is still there. He was, he's killed 500,000 people. You know, and Putin is, is banking, and, and he, he can hang on for a long time.